this squid body plan. As you can tell, it's very different from ours. Remember our body plan, central motor cord, dorsal nerve tube, uh, gill slits up front, post anal tail, it's a swimming torpedo. Uh, this is the cephalopod body plan, which is, first of all, a bag of guts, that's this stuff here, a visceral mass up here, with eyes in the middle and hanging down, you have this modified molluscan foot in these tentacles. And this is true of nomoids, the decapods, the squids, and the octopods, the octopuses. Uh, this is the pattern that they show. This is what they've got to build with. I like to think of this as the Pinewood Derby problem. Do you have Pinewood Derby in Canada? Are you looking at me mystified like you want to talk about? Mystify, okay. Uh, Cub Scouts in the United States, uh, we've got this, this yearly event where what they do is they hand each of the Cub Scouts a little kit and it contains a little block of pine, a little rectangular block of wood, and four plastic wheel, wheels and some fasteners, uh, and it's got a set of rules about what you can do. You, know, you can't put an engine in it. It's, it's a, you're supposed to build a little race car that they then put on an inclined track and you have races with the other kids in your club. Uh, so you're handed this package, and it constrains what you, what you can do. Sometimes you'll see the kids will do very, very exotic sorts of things. You know, they'll sometimes say, oh, "Okay, well, I'm going to make, I'm going to make a tricycle racer instead of a four-wheel thing." Uh, most of them do make something that looks vaguely like a car, but of course they they carve the pine to make whatever shapes they want. So there's a lot of variation in detail, but you generally find the same structure. And so. What's happening there is that you're constrained by what you start with. You are given a package. You're a squid. You are given this package. This is what you have to build from. And if you're trying to build something to compete with a swift swimmer like a fish, you'll be constrained to do certain things. Now, the pine with derby problem could be really made interesting is if every year you get the same goal. Your goal is to make a racer to go down this track. But instead of every year giving them the same thing, a block of wood and four wheels, uh, what if you get out of giving them a big lump of putty, some ball bearings, and a dozen balloons? <laughs> <laughs> and everyone would be sitting there and just like, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to do? But what you get is some very creative solutions, wouldn't you? Kids would try all kinds of things with this. Um, what if instead you gave them a bucket of plastic straws, some plaster of Paris, and a gerbil? <laughs> <laughs> Make a racer from that. Seriously, you know, kids are creative. They could do it. They would come up with something interesting. They would try something new. And there are all kinds of exotic things out there. Evolution and nature are even more creative than little kids. So give them a package, they do strange things with it. So we take this, this visceral blob with tentacles hanging down, and we turn it into a torpedo shaped sort of swimmer. That's amazing. That's powerful. That's what evolution can do. Okay, so what the message is here is different starting conditions, very different solutions will emerge to the same problem in physics and chemistry. Now, I have to say a few words about intelligence, uh, because that's what we're really interested in. You know, we're, we're not necessarily interested in flying out to the plants and meeting squidoids, okay? What we want to do is we want to meet people. We want to meet intelligent beings that we can talk to. And we want to figure out what things have happened in our history that might lead to intelligence. And I'm going to show you a diagram here. This is a diagram of Earth's history uh, from a biological perspective. What it illustrates, so this is again timeline, so looking here's the Cambrian, this is when modern when animal life emerged, and going up to modern day. And what's shown here by the width of this part of it is the number of species present on the planet. And what you can see is it's not uniform. We don't have a solid line here. What we have instead is at apparently roughly random intervals, there are major setbacks in the history of life. These are mass extinctions, huge mass extinctions. Life may be cruising along for 10 million years, 100 million years, and all of a sudden, bam, something comes along, and very few species survive and it gets through. Uh, the best known of these is the Cretaceous extinction. You've all heard of this over in here. Uh, this is when the dinosaurs got wiped out 65 million years ago. Uh, the biggest extinction of them all was here in the Permian. This diagram does not do it justice. Really, 99% of all species on the planet went extinct 
in one brief, geologically brief period. So there are radical things that are happening. The point I want to make here, though, is that each of these mass extinctions is like a massive game over man. Let's reset and start over. Let's rebuild from root stock and see what happens. So each of these represents, each of these periods between the extinctions represents like six different planets. Six planets with different life forms on them. You all know what's living back here is dinosaurs, right? Which don't exist anymore. Uh, back here there were these, these sailback things, these interesting uh, mammal-like reptiles that were thriving back in here. So different biota in each of these, these periods. And some of these lasted for quite long times. 100 million years. 150 million years. So it's not like there's a shortage of time for evolution to occur. Now, when we look at these, think again of these as six related big living worlds, six trials to see if evolution would spit up intelligent tool-using species. Now, to be fair, you can sort of exclude the first two because we hadn't evolved terrestrial life then. Uh, any aquatic, intelligent life might have been incredibly frustrated by the fact that it was really hard to light the fires <laughs> and smell metals and things like this. Uh, so maybe those don't count, but still, that's four trials to generate intelligent life. And only one of those gave rise to creatures like us. We were really kind of rare. This, right here, this is saying, okay, there's only 25% chance, at best, that you're going to get life on another planet that looks that functions like us, it has intelligence and tool using capabilities. And even there, what we see, what we learn when we look at these examples, is that tool using intelligent species seem to rise rapidly. We are flash in the pan here. You know, over the last million or so years is, is basically human evolution. And modern humans, 100,000 to 200,000 years, that's, that's just a tiny sliver of time. And if you think about it, you know, Agriculture, it's only a few thousand years old. Technology we use, it's only a few hundred years old. Uh, our cell phones, even younger, tiny little baby things. Uh, these things happen quickly, but we don't know that they succeed very well. You know, we could go extinct in the next century, and you know, 50 million years from now, when the highly evolved intelligent squidoids emerge from the ocean and take over the world, uh, they will dig up this era and we will be hardly noticeable. They will find a little layer of soot somewhere and some, some really smart squid will make a name for himself by recognizing this peculiar soot layer separating the proto-squid area era from the modern squid era, and that will be it. That's us. So you know, we get to work a little harder at surviving in the world. Uh, so we really can't say that it's successful yet. And that may be the thing, is that intelligence may be counterproductive. It may not be such a great thing from an evolutionary perspective. We can say that intelligence is not a ubiquitous adaptation. It's not like fangs, it's not like claws, it's not like wings or eyes. Uh, those are features that pop up independently, multiple times, lots of times in <laughs> history. Uh, but intelligence, nope. We're it, sort of. That's, that's it. That's kind of pathetic when you think of the fact that there's probably at least 100 million species that exist on this planet, and only one of them got to the point where we were making cell phones. <laughs> kind of sad. <laughs> but now, also, we sh maybe we have to recognize that intelligence doesn't seem to be one kind of thing either. We have our biases about what intelligence means. We have certain ways of thinking about the world. We, we associate with being intelligent. But there are these other creatures on the planet, like other apes, octopus, this is Stellar's J, this is the cetacean, it's a dolphin. They have big brains and they are intelligent and they can solve problems. And we know from psychological testing on these, these animals that they can model the world, that they're capable of self-reflection and are aware of themselves. They're, they're conscious creatures that do interesting things in an intelligent way. You know, the, the octopus was in there has, has psychic powers and predict World Cup victories. <laughs> 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 but they don't 
these tools, right? They're not like us, but we still have to say they're, they're some kind of intelligence. So, science fiction stories, you know, they love to speculate about meeting and communicating with aliens, but they always cheat and make the aliens mirrors of ourselves, so it's relatively easy. But here, of course, species are more, more closely related to us that share far more in common with us than any the aliens we might ever encounter. Yet we're trying harder to listen to conversations of unknown aliens with SETI than we are trying to have a chat with our next door neighbor, the octopus, or the dolphin. I would say, if you can't talk to dolphins yet, why are you wasting your time beaming messages into space or listening for messages from space? Oh, well, that's going to go over well. <laughs> <laughs> Can have a really tough time with a biochemically bizarre, anatomically improbable, historically unrelated tentacle blobs of homo hot or whatever. <laughs> so, let me summarize what I've been telling you so far today. Um, there are some general principles of biology that will universally apply when we're looking for aliens. Evolution doesn't just make finely tuned functional organisms, but it's also built on a foundation of chance. So, it spawns endless diversity. Also, every advance carries along the baggage of its ancestry, so we see echoes of our past in our every feature. We are the way we are because we evolved from tetrapods. Tetrapods were the way they were because they evolved from fish. And the more specific and complex a feature is, and intelligence is both of those, the less likely it is to emerge in the same form in different lineages. Now, I think I've got a little time left. Yeah, I've got a little time left. So there's one more brief and somewhat tangential point I have to make. Because it's weird, it, it's weird and it keeps coming up whenever we look at the media presentation of aliens. And I call it the Kirk effect. <laughs> uh, that's to boldly go and explore strange new worlds and to hump all the women. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't going to happen. Uh, this is the most outrageous example of the Kirk effect. Uh, it's from the space fantasy movie uh, Avatar. Some of you may have seen it. Uh, James Cameron consciously chose, for entirely understandable, dramatic, and profit making reasons, to completely ignore what science said and shape his feelings to fit human expectations. And that meant he had to make them sexy for the movie to work for his audiences. This is not the science part, okay? That's not science at all. Uh, this is more than just sticking large lumps of adipose tissue on the female's chest. <laughs> There's a lot of things in that alien right there that are consciously aped from human expectations. You don't even need to see a person face to face to recognize their sex. All you heterosexual men and lesbians out there, you know this, <laughs> that the sight of the nape of the neck, the curve of the waist, shape, that hourglass shape, all those are enough to make your heart go good at that, right? That's all it takes. You can tell these things. She's got them. <laughs> She's pretty good looking. And all you heterosexual women out there and gay men, you have your own set of cues. Broad shoulders, for instance. Narrow hips. Muscular bodies. They do it for you, right? <laughs> Why would you expect those to be present in aliens? Aliens never existed and never evolved to turn you on. <laughs> and so let me show you an example of this. I, I know this is a family audience, so if you're shy about female nudity or assertive sexual displays, I'm going to show you a bit of porn to make my point. So you can put your hands over your kids' eyes if you want, or your own. Because you may find this an extremely arousing image if you're a champion. <laughs> That's an image that's rich in sexual cues for a champion. The posture, this is a presentation posture. She is posing. She is flaunting for the male chimpanzee. That sleek, hairy body. <laughs> Think about stroking them. <laughs> the genitalia. 
greatly swollen by estrus into that bright pink lump. Ooh, isn't that arousing? <laughs> if there were a chimpanzee dude out there, he'd be printing stacks of magazines full of glossy photos just like this one. <laughs> Now, realistically, I know there's all 20 in a large crowd and on Rule 34 and all that, but I can pretty much guarantee you that almost all of you here find that completely lacking in all of the sexual cues that it's <laughs> And the more of the you probably find it pretty repellent. <laughs> you think you put a diaper on that baby. <laughs> this is so far from our species specific norm of sexual attraction. Yet, this is our closest living relative. <laughs> so, I'll leave you one, la one last useful word of advice. If you've been swayed by all the romantic imagery of the science fiction movie that suggests alien planets are full of intelligent space babes of exotic beauty, forget it. <laughs> space travel won't get you late. <laughs> Thank you. <I'll> Astronomer. <laughs>
That's still evolution. It's like, there's no way to escape it. It's, it's part of how we are. As I mentioned just a moment ago, imperfect replication, that's all you need. You've got evolution. And yes, we've got replication, and yeah, it's imperfect. So, presto, evolution. It will never end until we go extinct. Your opinion on uh, the difference in gravity and evolution on, say, different planets, as well as the ocean or water pressure or any liquid pressure, and what that would uh, do. Uh -huh. so, yeah. Well, again, I would say that life will find a way in these situations. Uh, the primary requirements, I would say, for, for finding life on a planet are probably going to be things like is it stable enough that, you know, that forms can exist for prolonged periods of time without being ripped apart. As I mentioned, we've got mass extinctions every 100 million years or so, which still allows plenty of time for evolution to take place. If they happen much more frequently, constantly resetting the game plan, uh, then we couldn't get evolution. But, but things like simply having a larger gravitational force, you know, more gravity on the planet, uh, being in a high pressure atmosphere, as long as it allows some form of stable chemistry to occur, I think life is possible. Now this fits in uh, thinking of gravity. I'm thinking of, we live in a planet of gravity where symmetry is important for locomotion or for fish in the ocean symmetry. Well, how do you see symmetry in terms of evolution on this planet or other places? Oh uh, yeah. Uh, how would you make a lopsided creature? Uh, could there be lopsided organisms? And there are some, of course. There are, there are organisms that exhibit no bilateral symmetry at all. And actually, when you look carefully at us, you know, look at your guts, they're asymmetrical. Your liver's on one side, your stomach's on another, your heart's skewed to one side, your intestines coil in particular ways. Uh, so asymmetry, asymmetry seems to be useful for propulsion. And that's one reason to have it. Uh, you know, so you know, if you're asymmetrical in your legs, you walk in circles a lot. So, <laughs> let's keep it symmetrical that way. Uh, it's also, another factor in symmetry is that it's, it seems to be used as a sexual cue. That you will, because the, the way development proceeds, if development proceeds well, and you're developing properly, and you're forming all your organs properly, they're in an appropriate place, you will emerge with a symmetrical shape and symmetrical features. Symmetry seems to be a major cue in beauty, for instance. Uh, and so there, there could be pressure there. Just this, this is a costly thing to maintain, is not having a lopsided place, maintaining bilateral control, and, and that's another reason to keep it around. Uh, so I think symmetry will probably be pretty common. Uh, I don't know what kind of environment would facilitate asymmetrical forms. <laughs> There are some, well, I'm thinking, there's, there're some organisms that live in corkscrew-shaped burrows, for instance, and they tend to acquire a handicus, but you'd have to have an environment that compels you to fit in a particular shape. More questions? There's somebody back there, or there's somebody here, okay. I really enjoyed the uh, looking at the uh, notions of aliens from the perspective of evolutionary problem solving, adaptive problem solving, from the biological and I'm wondering if you've ever sort of carried that thought experiment back even more to looking at from a biochemical point of view. We often hear about things like carbon-based life, life forms and the possibility of silicon-based life forms. And I'm wondering if, um, you know, have you ever looked at what are the chemical problems that right. we solve? Yeah, that's another case of we can imagine it, but we haven't seen it yet. Uh, those are going to be, those, those kinds of molecules are going to be important in different kinds of environments. We have to be familiar with forms that evolve on planets with a particular temperature range where you've got you know, liquid in all three phases, liquid water and gaseous water and, and uh, frozen water, all three phases are represented, so that's kind of a range there. Uh, the fact that water is our medium, uh, the fact that we've got lots of carbon around, that's really handy. You'd have to have a different environment where silicon became important. Uh, I don't know about the chemistry, whether that would I don't know whether it would actually be as good. You're going to find silicon mostly used in very high energy environments, and maybe those aren't stable enough. Those environments might be 
uh, so disruptive that you don't get much evolution going. So maybe you can get some primitive life forms, but uh, nothing like Star Trek's Horda going around you know, dreaming about things. Uh, the other interesting way to think about it, though, is, is to think biochemically, do we have to have the, the biochemistry that we have? Do we have to have the particular metabolites that we use? And I think the answer is no. That if you look at our biochemistry, there, there's lots of quirks. Things like our electron transport chain is really weird. It's, it's a strange little way to extract energy from fuel. Uh, and a lot of it seems very peculiar and very historical. Uh, things like uh, chlorophyll and how it interacts with plant chloroplasts, all that stuff. There, there's actually two fused biochemical pathways that are fused in a very strange way, and in some ways a very awkward way, uh, that are historical relics. Uh, so our particular biochemistry isn't necessarily the one you would have. Uh, I'll also mention one other peculiar thing. I, People do things like make uh, random peptides, right? random strings of proteins. Uh, if you do that, you don't want to drink it because some of those are actually toxic. We have evolutionarily filtered out the production of certain peptides that are deadly to us. So you might imagine if you find an alien life form, you wouldn't want to eat it either because it may be using something as a fundamental aspect of its biochemistry that is fundamentally antithetical to what our biochemistry does, and so it's very likely to be lethal to you. Uh, there are organisms like cone snails that take advantage of this. Cone snails make these incredibly potent venoms, and when you look at them, as you discover it's random polypeptides. And it just happens they've selected for certain random polypeptides that are deadly to us. So biochemistry chemistry can get really weird when you start getting into it. Okay, there was a question back there. Um, the slide that you showed where you had the, the different um, periods of time and you mentioned about the extinctions. Yes. Um, um, would the belief, yes, this one. Um, would the belief of, let's say, an asteroid coming to the Earth actually and wiping everything out, is there not a possibility, which you know, all the asteroids are exploding and planets and such, that there be a DNA strand locked in that asteroid? show up as a signature. You would, if you found some unique <coughs> DNA sequence that appeared suddenly at that transition and wasn't present in, wasn't likely to have been present in the previous few it just appeared there in certain images, uh, that would show up. We know about it. And we don't see that. When you look at the, uh, the when you look at the DNA sequences that we have now, we can trace them back really, really far. We're talking many of these, these essential sequences in metabolism, for instance, are billions of years old. We can tell that with molecular techniques. Uh, so they could not have arisen more recently than that. Uh, that that's, it's, again, it's a science fiction sort of possibility that people have talked about. Uh, and that's all it really is, is a remote possibility. I can imagine this at the beginning of life, but not in later events in life. Hello. Um, I'm curious uh, to uh, know how you would define life, um, because I've heard a bunch of different definitions, and I'm not sure if, uh -huh. you know, whether you would consider like uh, chemicals that can reproduce or reproduce themselves as life, if, or 
Yeah. I, I think I gave it earlier. An imperfect replicator. That's what life is. It's something that can replicate itself. Uh, and that's a pretty broad definition. Lots of things could fit that. Uh, it means that life doesn't have to be cellular, for instance. You can imagine an acellular form of life. And probably early life was acellular. acellular. Okay, I can tell you that has to be the last question. I'm sorry. I'll be hanging around afterwards.